Welcome. Uh, Mark is the Vice President of Major Development at United Launch Alliance, and he is in, in this position, he is responsible for the development of Vulcan. I'm going to let him do the rest of his introduction and jump right into the keynote, but welcome. We're thrilled to have you here today and excited to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you, Crystal, and uh, good morning, everyone. I think it's morning where uh, all of you are. Um, I didn't bring a dog, but hopefully I can hold all of your attention here uh, with some interesting discussions. So I was going to talk through uh, how to build a sustained presence in cislunar space and what we view are some of the keys to that. And then talk a little bit about rockets and the role that ULA plays um, with launch services in supporting the commercialization of space. Um, why don't we go to the first chart and the next chart. Yeah, so this is a uh, this is an overview of some of the different economic opportunities available in cislunar space. And what we really view as the key to a sustained presence is really unlocking the cislunar economy and finding you know, economic models that work in cislunar and enabling us to have a sustained presence. If you look at this chart, you're all probably familiar with several, if not all of these, um, but they're all important and they all could really be an anchor tenant, um, a key business that would allow us to continue and sustain a presence in cislunar. Anywhere from the upper left to uh, mining for rare materials um, of asteroids and other bodies uh, in cislunar to uh, electrical power generation uh, to support uh, activity here on the surface of Earth. Uh, in the upper right, interesting one is the uh, development and production of propellant in space, which is actually the first kind of business model to support other businesses operating in cislunar. And then on the lower right, of course, the production of materials, a lot of unique things you can do in zero G that you can't do here on the surface of the earth and actually manufacturing. And we see, you know, these are all opportunities to really provide a, uh, establish a cislunar economy and uh, have a sustained presence in cislunar. Much what we've already started to see in LEO over the last decade or so, and I think other people here in this forum have already spoken about, we see the real proliferation of um, business models operating in LEO and all of the, um, the sustained presence that supports. Um, ULA plays a big role in this and we're very excited and we have a couple exciting missions coming up uh, to support cislunar, anywhere from LEO uh, to the moon. Uh, next year, we have two launches on our new Vulcan Centaur rocket coming up, and I'll talk some more about that in an upcoming chart, uh, but very exciting. Uh, the first, about the second half of the year, we're going to launch the Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander on a course to the moon on our first flight of Vulcan Centaur, where they will deliver uh, commercial payloads and experiments to the surface of the moon, all in a commercial endeavor in partnership with NASA. So we're very excited about that. And then we'll come back a few months later with Vulcan Centaur and we'll launch the inaugural mission of the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser to the International Space Station, providing cargo support, cargo services. Um, another very important mission, uh, providing sustained operations on the space station uh, for years to come. And that flight of the Dream Chaser is just one of many that are planned on the ULA Vulcan Centaur launch vehicle. Um, we have a strong history of supporting uh, lunar exploration beyond what we're doing here for Peregrine um, with multiple missions. One of the most significant in recent years was the LCROSS mission that we launched on an Atlas vehicle a number of years back. LCROSS was significant in that it provided key data that was able to confirm the presence of liquid in the form of ice uh, near the poles of the moon, which, as we already talked about, could be a key element of a cislunar economy at especially when you get into things like propellant generation in space to support operations in cislunar or beyond. Um, you know, beyond the economic models that work in cislunar, we think we all have to be good neighbors in as we do business in cislunar. And part of that is being uh, very diligent in how we operate our systems and at the end of life, how we safe and dispose of those systems. And obviously, one of the key things I'm referring to here is orbital debris. Um, 
we have designed all of our rockets and continue to put in additional features to assure that they are safely disposed of at the end of their life. Um, we view this as a partnership. Um, the best way to approach this is a partnership between government and industry to make sure we develop the proper mitigation strategies for orbital debris and enact the proper regulations that we can all abide by to make sure, as I said, that we're good neighbors and this truly can be a uh, sustainable presence. Let's go on to the next chart and talk a little bit about rockets. Okay, um, so on the left, you'll see some cross sections of our Atlas and Vulcan rocket. Um, so we've been launching Atlas and Delta rockets since ULA was formed and they've served us uh, extremely well. Um, to the right, you'll see the new Vulcan Centaur rocket that I referred to that will launch next year with those inaugural missions with the uh, Astrobotics and Sierra Nevada um, missions. Um, Vulcan is being developed uh, to take over for Atlas and Delta and do everything those systems do and then some more in terms of both capabilities uh, during launch and on orbit as well as increased performance. The chart in the middle highlights that uh, performance contrasting Atlas in blue and Vulcan in red for the lift capability or performance to three different reference orbits. So you can see that Vulcan uh, greatly exceeds the Atlas performance for any of those three. And Vulcan's pretty unique and we work really hard in that Vulcan in that single core vehicle provides heavy lift class performance that normally you see in a three body vehicle like a Delta IV Heavy. And so that was, uh, took a lot of work um, but was really uh, a breakthrough for us in providing that level of performance and then the, of course the affordability that comes with a single body uh, vehicle. So we'll be on-ramping Vulcan next year and over the couple years after that uh, progressively transitioning our customers and their missions from Atlas and Delta to Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan's the product of competition. Um, we found ourselves um, five years ago Atlas and Delta had served us very well um, but our customers' requirements continued to evolve, technology moved forward, and we found ourselves in a more competitive environment needing uh, to develop a new launch system. And uh, that's what Vulcan was born out of. Um, we've been working on it very hard, and uh, we feel that our strategy and our product has been validated by a number of these recent competitive acquisitions. I already mentioned Sierra Nevada and Astrobotics, but probably the most significant was just a few weeks ago where uh, Vulcan Centaur and ULA was selected by the U.S. Space Force to be one of the two providers under their Phase 2 acquisition to launch all national security space payloads for the U.S. government from 2022 through 2027. So a significant award through this process, we were found to be the best value and the lowest price of all the providers uh, competing for that. So that was something very, we're very proud of and really um, validated um, all of our work that has gone into developing the Vulcan system. And we're very excited as we move toward first launch next year. Pictures on the right, uh, just show you some progress as we move toward that first launch. In the upper right is the new Vulcan mobile launch platform that's going through the final stages of assembly and test down at Cape Canaveral in preparation for launch next year. In the middle is a picture from our factory in Decatur, Alabama, where we build all of our rockets, including Vulcan and showing some investments in automated tooling to produce the primary structure of the rocket. And in the lower right, you'll see some pictures of that primary structure coming together for the first uh, flight configuration of that rocket. And that picture was taken a couple, uh, couple months ago. So making good progress there. As I spoke about national security and our big phase two win, uh, I just wanna emphasize that national security space is nothing new to ULA. And our very first mission as ULA was in support of national security space. And we've launched dozens and dozens and dozens of mission, missions, all with 100% mission success in support of national security space. In fact, this year with the formation of the US Space Force, we launched the first two missions for them. Back in March, we launched the AEHF-6 payload on an Atlas and came back about two months later at the Cape and launched the X-37B space plane also on an Atlas. So we're very proud to be able to continue this uh, history of supporting national security space uh, as that transitions from Atlas and Delta and we move on to Vulcan. ULA's commitment to our customers extend obviously beyond national security into uh, both civil and commercial markets. 
On the civil side, I talked about our efforts in cislunar, whether that was from LEO and space station all the way to the surface of the moon. Um, and we will continue to build upon those and support exploration beyond cislunar to Mars. And we've played a significant role in exploration of Mars for several decades. Um, if you weren't aware, everything that has ever driven around Mars is currently driving around Mars or is planned to drive around Mars in the near future has been launched on a ULA vehicle, either an Atlas or Delta. We're very proud of that. And that includes the Perseverance rover, which is on its way to Mars, was launched uh, about a month and a half ago on an Atlas vehicle with pinpoint accuracy. And we'll be landing on the surface of Mars in February of next year. And we're very excited to play a role in that and continue to support um, exploration uh, beyond Earth and beyond cislunar. So that's a little bit of an overview of you know, our, our take on cislunar and a sustained presence and the role that we're playing to support that as a launch service provider. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up here and uh, turn it over to all of you out there for any questions that you may have on these topics. Great, thank you so much, Mark, for giving us a sense of what you all are working on right now, but also how that might tie into sustainability. And so we're excited to delve into a few of those comments. Um, got a lot of questions coming in. Um, the first two are kind of on a similar topic. So I'm gonna start with those. Um, can you talk a little bit more about ULA's efforts to uh, responsibly dispose of upper stages and comply with debris mitigation practices? Sure, we'd be happy to. So you know, we have been and will continue to do, design all of our missions so that we are either disposing of the, the upper stage is the item of, of concern here that presents an orbital debris risk if not properly mitigated. And we have designed and will continue to design all of our missions and so reserving performance so that we can either deorbit the stage, send it beyond Earth orbit, or in some cases, at least put it in an orbit that is not a, of a concern, a non-active orbit. Uh, Vulcan Centaur will increase our flexibility further, and that's a higher performance rocket. So we have additional performance that we have reserved to, uh, to make sure that we can safely dispose of that. And uh, we will, we've been doing this for some time and we will continue to do it. It's just part of our baseline of how we operate and how we do business. Great. Um, another question that just came in. Well, what's the progress on developing green rocket fuels that are less toxic, toxic than some of the historical fuels like hydrazine? That's a good question. Um, we have a pretty limited use of hydrazine on our rockets currently. Um, we do not use hydrazine for the main propulsion for either stages. We use a limited amount of hydrazine currently on the upper stages of both um, our Atlas and Delta and Vulcan to start with will as well. But Vulcan, we have a plan to transition off the use of hydrazine in the coming years. The upper stage of Vulcan Centaur uses liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen for main propulsion for doing our large propulsive maneuvers. And we are developing a attitude control system. That's where we currently use the hydrazine for Vulcan that will run off liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, actually convert to the gaseous form first before uh, supplying it to the thrusters to provide all the attitude control and the fine adjustments to the uh, velocity and position of the vehicle um, after we're on orbit. And that's our plan. And we will first fly one of those thrusters uh, a couple years down the road. And a couple years after that, plan to be fully transitioned off the use of hydrazine. So that was an excellent question. I'm glad someone asked that because we're really proud of our efforts there. Yeah, it popped up right before I went to ask you a question and I couldn't resist. Um, another interesting one here. Uh, the FAA worked on rewriting a number of launch regulations. How will this affect uh, ULA and do you see this as a step towards sustainability? Yeah, we have, you know, we have participated, like we said earlier, and we talked about orbital debris mitigation. We really view it as a partnership. Um, and, you know, we provided input and worked collaboratively with the FAA and the other providers uh, to make sure that those um, regulations you know, met our needs, met the needs of our nation and the entire community. Um, I think what's important is the FAA and the other um, regulatory bodies play an important role in making sure that we all, as we talked about in one example earlier, that we're all good neighbors, we all do our part, we all have common standards and we're all held accountable to those standards. So 
there is an important role for the FAA and the other, other regulatory bodies in making sure that we operate uh, sustainably. And uh, we're very encouraged by the um, partnership and participation that the FAA has afforded us in this process and look forward uh, to continuing to work with them and the other um, users in the community. Kind of building on that a little bit, there's also a question about commercial sector best practices. So what is ULA's position on the increasing trend of the commercial sector coming up with their own standards and norms of behavior in regards to space? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, ULA, we're often viewed as a national security launch provider. That's certainly the cornerstone of our business, but we operate across both the uh, national security space, civil and commercial markets, and we have to comply with a plethora of different regulations depending on where we operate. And, um, you know, we, we often, um, we have our own standards too that we have developed, and we often use commercial standards as well. I think what the key is in all these cases is partnering with whoever the regulatory body or your customer is to, de to you know, demonstrate that your standards meet the intent of and accomplish the same thing. They may do it in a different way. And so it's important through all this whole process is that is everyone is open-minded and focus on what the objective or the intent is and are flexible about how that is accomplished. And so even like I said, for our national security space missions, which we have very stringent requirements, um, we have a lot of different ways we do things uh, to support that customer. And this is just an example, um, but the objective, the intent and the outcome in the end is the same. And I think those same kind of practices can be applied to how we view the use of commercial standards. And so, yeah, we encourage that. Great, um, kind of looping back to one of our first questions. There's an interesting one here about SSA. Does ULA use commercially provided SSA to track its launch vehicles and launch related objects? We currently do not. So we currently, we're launching out of the Eastern and Western ranges um, here in the United States, obviously Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg Air Force Base. And so we currently use all the infrastructure and assets provided by the US Space Force for uh, tracking of our vehicles. All right, um, this one, I, I Mark Mulholland asked a great question, and one of which I'm very curious about as well. Um, what measures have you taken to ensure mission success operating in a much more hazardous space weather environment in cislunar space? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's a hard one, right? <laughs> it's a hard one. Um, most, so, so space weather in the environments of going beyond, we'll say LEO, and we do have missions, um, you know, we do direct insertion right to geostationary orbit. Um, that's something that we have done in the past and we will continue to offer and actually Vulcan is even more capable and that's something that is, we think of great value. Um, so right now, most of our missions last from, you know, from 20 minutes in duration to maybe eight or 12 hours. And so we certainly have the benefit of time on our side, you know, versus having exposure for for days or weeks or years or beyond. So that has been, you know, our experience and as a launch vehicle provider, that experience is very different than if you're a spacecraft or satellite manufacturer where you're going to operate in those environments for um, a much longer time. We, we do see increased need for our launch services and having extended duration. Um, we expect that to be, you know, extending into days and weeks you know, to, as that launch service um, extends. And so we'll build on upon, you know, our current experience um, operating in Cislunar for those relatively shorter durations. So kind of building on that, actually one of my colleagues asked a question. He's gonna be hosting a panel on Cislunar sustainability in just a couple days. And I was kind of joking in a lot of our pre-meetings that when we picked our panel topics back in January and February, Cislunar wasn't getting nearly as much attention as it is now. A lot has changed in the last few months and you guys are obviously a big part of that. And so we'd love to hear your thoughts on some of what's gonna happen for that panel. And so his question is, are regulations which reflect space sustainability requirements truly burdensome or are they a crucial part of running a long lasting sustainable space company? Like how do you see that interaction with regulation? Sure, well, so first of all, yeah, it is interesting how the interest in cislunar kind of ebbs and flows. Um, we've been talking it for five, eight years. Um, 
we're a launch vehicle provider, but we view we're a key element of that. And, you know, we've gone so far to hold workshops, you know, really looking at Cislunar and how to have a sustained presence and the various uh, economic models. Um, your question about, you know, regulations and how regulations, I, so I'll be very interested to watch the next panel and see how this is um, discussed in that panel. I, I think the biggest obstacles to Cislunar aren't regulations, it's getting back to finding the business models and that have inherent economic value that will, you know, promote the investment and the risk taking necessary um, to operate sustainably and for the long duration in Cislunar. So that's a, a launch vehicle provider's perspective. Um, we have a couple of more market-based questions. Um, so one question here is, what are the market opportunities for a triple core Vulcan Centaur rocket? Well, that is an interesting question. So that's someone who's been following ULA uh, pretty carefully. So um, the picture of the rocket I showed earlier, and I talked about that the basic uh, Vulcan Centaur with solid rocket motor strapped on to augment performance, that single core vehicle provides what we would traditionally classify as heavy lift performance, um, what we would you know, do with a Delta IV heavy um, currently. Um, you know, we are continually studying you know, evolution of our product line. I mean, we're, not, we're, we're in the middle of still developing a rocket and upgrading that, but we're not gonna rest on our laurels and we're gonna continue to evaluate what the market needs. The idea of a three core Vulcan heavy is a um, significant jump in performance and something that could support a lot of emerging, but I would say not mature needs in both um, LEO and Cislunar. So it's really gonna be, so we got a lot in our plate right now, getting the first launch on Vulcan with the basic vehicle, and there's a number of other uh, variants of that that will be introduced and upgrades to that, that will be introduced in the coming years after that inaugural launch. And so we have our plate pretty full, but ultimately it's gonna be the customers and the market that drives where we head with product development and a three core Vulcan heavy is just one of the many things that uh, we're looking on, looking at right now. And that's, that's, you know, pretty far out in the horizon. Great. Yeah, I agree. That was a quite specific one, but sometimes it's really good opportunity to engage on that. Um, another one kind of in that same vein, does ULA foresee resuming work in the future on the ACEs upper stage to support cislunar activities? Sure. So ASIS was a concept um, that we were working on five, eight years ago. Um, much like we talk about the future and way out in the horizon of potential uh, three-body Vulcan heavy vehicle, ASIS was a concept that looked at all the possible different things that we could do with an upper stage uh, to support emerging needs across all the markets. And, and some keys to it were high performance, extended mission duration, um, a, a lot of other things like that. Um, and so we did a lot of studies. We did a lot of, we invested in a lot of technology development to really assess the feasibility of some of the innovative features of ACES. And that has served us well because a lot of those, um, that original ACES work has its fingerprints in what we currently see as our new version of Centaur, the Centaur 5 that we're fielding with Vulcan. And so the, um, you know, significant growth in performance of the upper stage and a lot of the other technologies, the transition away from hydrazine to a hydrogen oxygen upper stage attitude control system. Those were all things that, uh, you know, were started. The genesis was those original advanced program studies of ACES. So, so ACES certainly, those studies five, eight years ago certainly served us well and it put us on a good path forward here for the evolution of our upper stages. And we will, you know, continue to evolve our upper stage uh, to meet the needs of the market going forward. Great. Um, what I'm going to do now is ask uh, one final question just to kind of close it out. We really appreciate you being here today. I know I learned a lot about what ULA is working on and it's just really good to hear uh, from new voices, especially since we all are now chatting with each other at various events. Um, it's easy to focus on our work and not necessarily follow exactly what all of the developments are. So thank you for that. Um, I kind of want to take a little bit back to space sustainability. And so uh, one of the last questions I have is, you know, what do you see as the future of space sustainability and what is industry's role in that? You know, how can they enable and ensure that the environment continues to work in a way that works for everyone? I think, you know, really the key to sustainability, we talk about economic models, 
um, in viable economic models. What goes hand in hand with a viable economic model is having uh, a robust infrastructure and an affordable infrastructure for doing business. Those kind of go hand in hand, and you, know, you can see obviously examples and on across the economy uh, where many business models just weren't viable until you had the basic infrastructure in place. And so, so launch is obviously not the, but it is one of the, a key element of the infrastructure. Um, and so industry's role in making sure that we have low cost, reliable, responsive access to space is foundational uh, for Cislunar. And obviously I'm a launch guy uh, from a rocket company. And so, um, so that's, you know, we view that as, as fundamental. And uh, so what's important, right, is that we continue to invest in these systems, um, improve their reliability, affordability, and really listen to what our, uh, our customers need. And obviously, uh, be good neighbors, good users of this environment, and do so responsibly. And uh, as we talked about earlier, um, relative to orbital debris and so forth.